to dawn a researcher, dawn an angel. In the terrain of El Beit, we have great issues, and they are profound and thought-provoking. It's the field of El Beit, humanity and mercy. We could, by some means or other, to have their papers apply to our life, to be a remedy, a cue, to save God, and also to salvage man from any kind of loss. It's the age of Ahl Bayt, man in hardship and flora, fauna, all together, they revert to Ahl Bayt in such times. As we'd taken the initiative in the morning session, we shall start uh, ahead to have the other evening session with different researchers from different countries and different viewpoints. That is why I call your attention and your attentive mind to the researchers. And I call Mr. Chairman, Dr. Hashim al Husseini and the convener, Dr. Adawiya, to have the stage and they are most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tayyibin al-tahirin. I am so uh, happy to be here among uh, the distinguished uh, audience, professor and colleagues to chair the second session for the second international Imam at seven days. Uh, we are uh, here uh, to deal with nine uh, papers or nine articles that are going to be dealing with this uh, conference. Uh, I'd like now uh, to introduce the papers that are going to be uh, here. We have nine uh, papers that are talking about different topics that are related to the uh, imamates, uh, seven days, and to uh, uh, some linguistic and religious aspects here. These are going to be coming from different countries, from Canada, from Iraq, from Iran, from Germany, and we are going to thank them for attending this uh, conference in order to enrich uh, the process of this conference in this holy place. Uh, I am going to uh, call the first paper or the researchers for not more than 10 minutes to present their paper. Now we are going to start with the uh, professor, Dr. Liaqat Takum from Makas Master University in his research title, represented by the role of ethics in Islamic jurisprudence, uh, a Muslim dilemma. Uh, Dr. Lakayat Takum. Okay. Now we are going to start with uh, Professor Dr. Salih Al Ma'mouri and Assistant Lecturer Safa Naji Abid to present their article represented by a critical rhetorical analysis to revitalization in Imam Al Qalim teachings from Iraq. Both of them are from the College of Education for Human Sciences, Babylon University. He is welcome to present his. Uh, title for his research in not more than 10 minutes. We hope that we might get what we are looking for and what we are praying for. So I'm only want to thank those who are working at such a distinguished uh, session. The paper is entitled A Critical Rhetorical Analysis to Revitalization in Imam al kavim Salamullah Ali teachings. Actually, we have so many speeches or teachings said by Imam al kavim Salamullah Ali, taken from al majlisi sites and books and translated by the site itself. 10 of these actually analyzed uh, critically and pragmatically. The teachings Uh, actually deals with the theme of 
revitalization since many of his speeches or teachings promote the adversary to grow, to be reguided, or to, let us say, move directly in the line or in the path that we are asked to go with since we all actually need to be uh, re Fertilized. The study aims to analyze the theme from critical rhetorical perspectives. It seeks to find the types of ideology found. You know that such ideologies are all positive ones. One might think that such, or some, let us say, of ideologies might be negative, that actually all the ideologies mentioned in these speeches are positive ones. They want us they actually to go to the safe side. This kind of power, the persuasive strategies and rhetorical strategies, functions and purposes behind such a speech in, these, uh, in this data. Actually, the study comes with two kinds of ideologies, which are domination and freedom. From the title, we can judge that freedom that we are created to be free. But being free, it's not necessarily we are going to do what we like without being guided and restricted with what the Creator Jalla wa'ala asks us to do. Besides, this is what is so-called domination of the Creator and the freedom of the say the people that should be. Two types, or three types, sorry, three types of power are included in this, depending on the study itself. The study actually raised three or four questions. The main ones are, what are the types of ideologies actually found, observed, looked for in this or these speeches? What are the persuasive strategies? Are these persuasive strategies vital enough to direct the message or to, let us say, make the, uh, the listeners or those who might, the addressee, let us say, be guided with such speeches? What are the rhetorical strategies? How these rhetorical strategies, what is or what are their effects in dealing with these two types of ideologies, I mean, domination and power. The aims is to detect these types and finding out the strategies and identifying them. The forms of power, actually, the power that we are looking for, or we might be, let us say, guided with is of three types that had been theorized. The first one is power over. Power means that the power that comes from the outside by, let us say, the rules governed what we are looking for. So we should be within such rules. This is why they are called, according to the theory, power over. And power with, in power with, as if we are going to, let us say, assist each other taking what might be advantageous, what might be good, what might be firing from what might be that this is he and this is, let us say, she. No. What might be good should be taken in consideration. This is so-called power in. The most difficult power we are going to sit with in dealing with is power from within. Sometimes humans actually suffer from having um, ideologies that we couldn't, let us say, uh, drop, we couldn't, let us say, leave to. Let us say some positive ones. This is the, the, the most difficult point. In the speech is uh, directed to others, and we have some, let us say, extract in this. For example, I have some examples actually here and there, saying, wa'lamu. إن الكلمة من الحكمة ضالة المؤمن فعليكم بالعلم. So now, as if he, I mean the speaker, Imam Al-Kawm, سلام الله عليه, 
direct as to what? In al kalimata min al hikmah. So first, you should be wise enough to have your word saying to be valid. And ضَالَّةِ الْمُؤْمِنِ فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْعِلْمِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُرْفَعَ So be careful that not all what might be said should be valid. And this is what we are suffering from nowadays, since so many sources of what might be theorized or said here and there, and might be negatively, unfortunately, might be followed by others. And I think that Ahlul Bayt Salaam suffered from having, wow. Zain. So many rhetorical strategies, and you know what is my rhetorical strategies. Those who are using such tools in their speeches are not ordinary people. First, they should be well educated. They should know how to functionalize these things, starting from what's so-called uh, syllogism, means uh, that logically we can, uh, we can judge. Alam tara kayfa kada, Allah jalla wa'ala yuhajij in such persuasive, let us say, device in saying, and so many other ones ends with what's so-called intertextuality. Intertextuality that is going to give ayahs, proverbs, who's sayings, whatever, that will guide us in this um, chance. Did you give up now to take good? Yes, thank you. The study actually comes up with, with a set of conclusions. Imam al kafir salam alayhi, activates the adversary to rebuild. And this is the lesson that we should actually get. To rebuild and restructure themselves mostly by their own. And, and this is approved by highly percentages actually accounted in this paper by the frequencies made. The second one is response shaping, which is one of the main powerful strategies used by Imam al kafir salam alayhi, should be again reinforced and rechange by utilizing such uh, powerful uh, strategies, active strategies. So many, let us say, rhetorical strategies used. The most difficult one is, oh, sorry, the most active one is syllogism. And the theoretical purposes are seen in the select teachings that are deliberative and forensic and demonstrative which actually guide the whole social issues of our daily life, even our daily life, by the way. The last one, the function behind such speeches is to encourage, to instruct, to describe, to frighten, to, to, to all the social needs that we are in nowadays actually work with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Saleh, for such uh, presentation. Uh, now, if you have any comments about uh, uh, your, uh, the papers that are going to be tackled here, you can register your comments and they are going to be uh, discussed in, at the end of the session. After the session. He's coming? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Prof. Dr. Lika Atakam from McMaster University. His uh, paper is entitled The Role of Ethics in Islamic Jurisprudence, uh, uh, a Muslim uh, Dilemma. Yes, please. Welcome to the stage. Awadhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, first of all, let me say it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and I appreciate and I thank Atabat al Abbasia too in, for the invitation. It's very important to hold such conferences because as I was saying to some colleagues today morning, Shia Islam in the West, in Western academia for the longest period was seen as somehow a deviation from Sunni Islam. So they studied Shia Islam through Sunni books and through Sunni lenses. It is only fairly recently now, in the past few, maybe decade or so, that more Shia books are coming up and uh, spoken or represented by Shia scholars or those who are specialists in Shia studies. So we see now the West is seeing Shia Islam through Shia sources. And that's a big transition, by the way. As I said, for a long time, uh, things were seen very differently. Um, the topic of my paper actually has changed. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Shia tafsir, one of the subjects that has not been studied enough in the Western academia. 
is a development of and the content of Shia tafsir and especially the role of the imams uh, in the Quranic tafsir. So that's going to be my topic. Tafsir itself is a literary activity to comprehend the divine message, to unveil or uncover the meanings of the Quran. It is important to understand that an exegete that is a commentator of the Quran is not a disinterested bystanders. In fact, the one who is commenting on the Quran through his choice of words or her choice, normally it's a him, uh, their, through their beliefs, biases, bring their own ideas to the tafsir. So in many cases, exegesis or tafsir reveals more about the beliefs of the commentator than about the, com no, the content of the Quran. To be sure, for the Shias, the relationship of the Imam with the Quran is exegetical. In other words, the Imam provides the exegesis, the tafsir of the Quran. There is another dimension. I cannot go through the whole paper because we have limited time. Another dimension of Shia tafsir is, of course, ta'wil. And ta'wil, generally speaking, is seen as the esoteric aspect of the Quran. In other words, the inner aspects. And there are inner and there are layers of esoteric, esotericism. But why is ta'wil important, especially in Shia Islam? Because it shows that the Imams have extra powers or extra abilities, mir miracles, etc., which are only seen through the ta'wil rather than through the tafsir. It is the esoteric, the ta'wil, which justifies the belief in the Imam's supernatural and mystical qualities, and more importantly, to interpret the Quran authentically. So the question is not only of tafsir and ta'wil, the authenticity and the authority to interpret the Quran is equally important. Historically, we know that, of course, the Prophet ﷺ himself was seen as the first mufassir because he was the one who was explaining the Quran. There is no doubt that the first mufassir after the Prophet was Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. In fact, he wrote a, uh, the Quran itself, the interpretation of it. And Ibn Nadim says in his book that he went to a person called Ja'far. He doesn't uh, describe who Ja'far is. And he saw fragments of Imam Ali's Quran with Jafar. Historically, we know that there were other uh, disciples of the Imam that I will discuss in a few minutes. But one of the most important mufassir of the Quran was Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. There was a tafsir that he wrote. Unfortunately, most of these books are no longer with us. However, the Imam had a disciple, a very important disciple, who was, he came to be a Zaidi, Abu Jarud. And Abu Jarud's tafsir, was transmitted by later scholars and some of his works, some of his points and tafsir, which came from Imam al-Baqir, by the way, they are, were available and we see in uh, Al-Qummi's tafsir, we see Qala Abu Jarud, sometimes Qala uh, al-Baqir and so on. So we know that actually parts of Imam uh, Muhammad al-Baqir's tafsir either came to us through directly through the Imam or through Abu Jarud. In fact, Al-Qummi, narrates 202 times from Abu Jarud. Another way of we got the tafsir of the imams, and I want to emphasize the role of the imams in the tafsir, is through Tabari himself. Tabari relates no less than 53 times from Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Altogether, the disciples of the imams wrote no less than 100 tafsir of the Quran. We know this because when we go through the works of Najashi and through Tusi, the Rijal works, we find uh, kitabu tafsir, and he has a book of tafsir and so on. So that tells us that it wasn't only just one or two disciples, no less than 100 disciples of the Imams who got the tafsir from them themselves. I don't want to go into the details of these um, uh, disciples. I have some of them at least. For example, Ismail bin uh, as sudi whose tafsir was transmitted from Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq alayhi wa salam. Atiyah, who was al -Awfi, who was from Kufa, he transmitted from the tafsir of the life of Abbas and from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, and apparently he had a five-volume work on the Quran. And there are many others. What was interesting is that people like Ibn Tawus had a copy of Abu Jarud's work, and he notes this very clearly in his own work. 
as I say, because of lack of time, I'm not going to mention all the other disciples. But what is also important that the imams were actually responsible for the interpretation and the spread of Quranic verses in their own times. We, um, this is, by the way, part of my book which I'm writing now on Shia Tafsir. As I say, in English literature, we only have two main books on Shia Tafsir so far. One was written by uh, a Jew and one was written by a Christian. Isn't it ironic that Jews and Christians write about our tafsir rather than we write about it? There are a few articles here and there, but book-wise, this is why I want to write a tafsir from the time of the Imams up to the time of Allama Tabatabai. We find also in the tafsir of Ali bin Ibrahim al-Qummi and Ayashi, these are the two main ones, the pre avoid periods is that they are, well, their style is of tafsir bin ma'athur that is based only on traditions. They do not really care about the authenticity of these traditions, the accuracy of them. They just report it as they found it. And some of this was, I must admit, not very accurate ones. Therefore, we find with Sheikh Tusi and Sheikh Tabrisi, tell me if it's time. Excuse me, bro, but uh, your title here is related to the role of ethics. Is it I know, I know. Well, it ethics? was actually connected. It was a mix up because I did tell them that uh, uh -huh. my title is because different. You have only three minutes. Three minutes? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm not talking about ethics. I, I did mention at the beginning okay. that uh, my title has changed. I'm sorry. Okay. So in this Tafsir Ma'thur, the title or the discourse was Imam-centered. There was more emphasis on locating the Imam in the Quran. This is by uh, Al-Qummi and Ayashi. In other words, the Quran was interpreted through and to accord with the traditions rather than the other way around. Instead of the hadith corroborating the Quran, the Quran was made to find Shia doctrines. Why was this very important at this time? And I have two minutes, so I will finish soon. The exegesis, the commentators were trying to assure the faithful Shias regarding the validity of their belief that salvation was only possible by accepting the correct Imam. And that correct Imam was through the Tawil of the Quran. Unless they acknowledge the true figure, the Imam, the Shias could not be saved. The Tafsir al-Ma'thur was also important because it drew boundaries of what was acceptable belief and what was acceptable practices. This textual rendition that claimed to be orthodox also suppressed dialogue because it's just one way coming from an authoritative figure. The Tafsir al-Ma'thur is also important as it limits the possible interpretations of the verse. It steers an interpretation in a particular direction and it limits rather than expand Quranic hermeneutics. There is what we call a monovalent reading of the Quran. In other words, the Quran is read only in one particular way. So we find with uh, Tabarsi and Tusi, it's a much different style. There's much more dialogue and more rational interpretation. So in short then, in conclusion then, the Tafsir bil Ma'thur was very important during that time because not only did it transmit the teachings of the Quran, but it ensured that the Shia faithful knew exactly from this tafsir what was acceptable belief and practices, at the same time exposing those who had, who had deviated from the Quran itself. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, thank you very much, Bro of Liaqid. Thanks a lot for such Yeah, I'm sorry uh, about the uh, confusion in titles. Yes, because it is different here. Thank you very much. Sultani, uh, PhD in Islamic History, uh, History uh, Baqar Al Ulum University. Uh, the title is The Encounter of Imam Al Qadim, peace be upon him, with the challenges of the Greek Arabic translation movement. Yes, please welcome to the stage. Bismillah <laughs> ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. Hello everyone, thank you for giving me this chance to share my ideas regarding the role of Imam al Qazim salam in challenging, uh, in encountering the challenges of Greco-Arabic translation movements. <clears throat> the Greco-Arabic translation initiative represented a significant and well-supported endeavor aimed at rendering a substantial corpus of secular Greek text into Arabic. This movement took place in Baghdad from the mid-8th century through the late 10th century. 
numerous Greek works spanning fields such as philosophy, medicine, science were successfully translated into Arabic. This translation exerted a profound influence on the development of Islamic philosophy. Um, we know that uh, in the second century after Hijra, we have uh, many important incidents uh, which had many effects on the political and social aspects of the Islamic society. The first one was the translation, uh, sorry, the transition uh, of the government from Umayyad to Abbasid and uh, imams, uh, uh, for example, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam had this freedom of uh, preaching uh, and saying his thought uh, more freely than others. And in some uh, years of Imam al-Kazim alayhi salam, we have the same uh, freedom. The second important uh, incident in this time is uh, that Baghdad was constructed in 149, and uh, the presence of uh, different denominations and religious groups in Baghdad uh, was very uh, important in this time, where we have many debates, inter-religious debates, uh, between different sects and uh, groups of religious groups in this time. And uh, during these debates, we can uh, see that these uh, Hellenistic ideas can penetrate the thought of the Muslim society. And uh, the third one is the translation movement, which we know uh, some, uh, in some incidents, uh, in some evidences, something about uh, this translation uh, movement and what was translated. And uh, what was important for me uh, was to find the evidences that uh, these translations were before uh, the martyrdom of Imam al-Qazim. And because of that, uh, I would expect that Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam as the leader uh, of the Shia society, at least the Shia society, should have some sort of encounter with these ideas. So uh, just to mention some of these evidences, uh, in the time of Umayyads, we have uh, this report that George, the Bishop of the Arabs, had translated three parts of Aristotle's organon. Uh, Mansur has ordered to translate some of the work of Ar Aristotle. Uh, Mahdi Al-Mahdi Abbasi also uh, ordered to translate Kitab al-Jadal of Aris Aristotle. Uh, Ibn Muqaffa, who died in 143 before Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam, is reported to have translated uh, three books of Aristotle and one uh, book of Ferforius. Uh, and also one important in, uh, evidence is uh, one of the uh, students of Ibn Muqaffa, who is Faiz ibn Abi Saleh, uh, who is uh, also accused of tendency toward Zandaqa. And uh, so, uh, it is very important, this uh, evidence, because we can say that Ibn Mughaffa, who is one of the main translators of Greek ideas and Greek works into Arabic, could have uh, some effects on his students, like Faisal ibn Abi Saleh. Uh, the other uh, evidence is uh, Timothy I, who had a debate with Mahdi al Abbasi in 165. Uh, it is mentioned that he has translated the book of topic of the uh, Aristotle uh, into Arabic with the intermediary language of Syriac, of course. And the last one is Zarar ibn Amr al-Mu'tazili, uh, who is mentioned who, uh, that has uh, written a critique on Aristotle's idea. So all of this show that uh, in the time of Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam, the penetration of these ideas uh, could be observed. Therefore, uh, not only as, as a Shi'i uh, Muslim, but uh, as a historian, we can expect the uh, encounter of Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam with all of these uh, Greek ideas. So uh, I tried to search all of the hadith of Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam to find uh, some sort of encounter with this uh, penetration of ideas. Uh, uh, in different uh, issues regarding theology. Uh, the first issue uh, was uh, God and his attributes. Uh, 
Uh, we know that Greek philosophers held mythology in high regard, considering it an internal part uh, of their historical narrative. However, not all philosophers adhered to gods depicted in popular myth. A comprehensive analysis of Greek civilization reveals a fascinating evolution. Over time, this illusionment led them to rationalize their philosophical respectives, and eventually they believed in a higher god. So in Socratic philosophy, God does not occupy a significant role. For Plato, the concept of God and theology remained intricate and subject to diverse interpretation. Aristotle begins by contemplating the concept of God and existence. He asserts that there must exist an internal and impre imperishable substance. Thales suggested that supreme God directly produces the universe from itself. So you know, we can see many diverse ideas regarding God in philosophy. Uh, referring to Imam Qasim alayhi salam narratives, one of the major issues is God and his attributes. Narrated by al kulaini in some hadith, Imam asserts that God is not a materialistic being. He also denied any kind of motion for God. Imam had always referred people to the Quran to find the best explanation for the attributes of God. Imam asserts the fact that the world is contingent and created in a definitive time, and God argues with this evidence on the necessity uh, of his eternal existence. The other issue regarding God is eradicating Qulov. In Greek mythology, some figures were born as humans, but later became gods. So these ideas were common in Greek philosophy. During the period of Imams, also, we see this kind of ideas, Al-Quluv. Uh, and in the time of Imam Al-Qazim, for example, we can see uh, Ar-Rawandiyah, who believed in the divine nature of uh, Abu Muslim and also the Caliph. Notably, during the time of Imam Al-Qazim, representatives of this movement were present, and Imam engaged in efforts to encounter their influence. For example, one minute. Okay. So uh, one of the famous incidents is uh, Muhammad ibn Bashir, who also was uh, harshly uh, opposed by Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam. In, the, in other uh, issues, determinism, also a kind of Greek uh, idea, which was encountered by Imam al-Qazim, you can see in his ahadith, many references to rejecting algebra and determinism. And also in uh, prophethood, Greek philosophers believe that some philosophers can have some kind of uh, miracle, some kind of uh, relation to God. And uh, uh, in a parallel way, in Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam ahadith, we can uh, find uh, some uh, way to define the true uh, way of defining uh, prophethood. So going to the... Uh, conclusions. <clears throat> Imam al Qazim salam, had an, uh, we think he had an active confrontation with the negative consequences of this movement in the uh, realm of theology uh, in terms of uh, the, is the issues regarding God, God and his attributes, eradicating Qulov, and uh, other issues regarding God. And what uh, was very important in the ahadith of Imam al-Qazim alayhi salam was the last one referring to himself in particular and to Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam in general as those wasi and the successor of the Prophet can be a great confrontation with increasing blind translation and imitation of Greek secular sciences because he said that uh, you cannot refer blindly to the other ideas and the true uh, the truth of the Islam and the attributes of God and other theological concepts should be achieved by referring to Imam and uh, the Holy Quran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sultani, for uh, such uh, an important topic because here uh, the Muslims are going to encounter many uh, problems at that time in the time of Imam Qasim. Thank you very much for yeah. such a paper. Yes. Now yes, we then. are going to start with the fourth article. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ali Rada, Associate Researcher, University of Göttingen, Germany. Observing the Imam nonverbal teaching in Imam Hadith. Yes, welcome to the stage. Yes. 
Ali Rada, PhD in Arabic and Islamic Studies from the University of Göttingen in Germany, 2021. Lebanese German scholar based in Germany. Uh, currently, uh, he is an affiliated researcher at the University of Göttingen, previously graduated from the American University of Beirut. Uh, he is a specialist, a specialist in the intellectual and social history of Shia Islam, focusing on uh, fiqh, hadith, and theology. He has worked in various research projects on education thought in classical Islam. Uh, and uh, he, among uh, his publications, uh, avoiding unjust ru uh, rules in imami ethical discourse, insights on imam learning at the turn of the 4th and 10th century. OK, Dr. Ali, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the generous introduction. Just let me set this. So, Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In this brief communication, it's my aim to explore some Imami Hadith reports from one part particular perspective, namely how a relatively large number of Hadith texts depict the Imams as teachers and the conversation with their followers as an educational encounter. Several thoughts can be derived from such an approach, but to narrow the scope of the paper, I will focus on those texts that consist of what can be termed nonverbal teaching of the Imams. Let me start with a concrete example. Hamad ibn Isa al-Juhani al-Basri, a companion of the sixth, seventh, and eighth Imams, reports in a hadith preserved in many Imami compilations how he was asked by the Imam if he had learned the right way of performing prayers. Ya Hamad, tuhsinu an tusalli. Hamad replied in affirmation, adding that he memorizes the book of Hariz ibn Abdullah on Salat. Al-Imam al-Sadiq wished nevertheless to put Hamad's knowledge to testing. He asked him to perform an exemplary prayer, Qum Fasalli. Surprisingly, the Imam was not satisfied with Hamad's performance, which brought shame to Hamad, as he states, فَأَصَابَنِي فِي نَفْسِ الذل. The Imam then showed Hamad the proper way of performing prayers. The disciple transmitted the actions of the Imam, and the information is preserved in one of the most iconic traditions on this topic. The report of Hamad is a long one, and it's not my intention in this presentation to go over its fiqh details. What this research is concerned about is the educational aspect of this incident that was arguably not the only case where Hamad held the position of a student. In fact, one of his writings is titled Masail al-Tilmid, the inquiries of the disciple. <coughs> As an Najashi reports, Hamad asked Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn Ali al-Sadiq these questions that are in the book, and the Imam answered him. The work as such is lost. We don't have the book. But it is a remarkable feature, cannot be missed. Hamad, regardless uh, of his scholarly status and merits, as one of the most informed companions of the Imams, conceptualizes his relationship with the Sadiq in an educational context and depicts himself as a mere student of a disciple, of a, uh, of a master. This resonates perfectly with another tradition transmitted on the authority of Imam Sadiq. We are those who know and our Shia are those who learn. نحن العلماء وشيعتنا المتعلمون. Now, reading Hamad's reports from an educational perspective, the following points deserve much attention. First, the Imams assumed in words and deeds the position of teachers and instructors. Their followers, too, admitted this role and understood that they stand in a learning relationship with a master of religious knowledge, not just a religious authority, as is the case with a caliph or a state official. That the Imams assumed this role is well established in the research on Imami Hadith. For instance, in an extended work on the contradiction in Hadith, Ikhtilaf al-Hadith, Grand Ayatollah Sistani proposed a hermeneutical model that distinguishes between two styles of speech in the sayings of the Imams, the juristic style, Uslub al futya and the teaching style, Uslub al talim This crucial distinction helps in appreciating the encounters of Imams with their disciples as moments of teaching and learning, in which the dynamics of, of the relationship are slightly different. The compassionate, 
sympathetic and caring persona of the Imam meets the curious, eager, and inquiring soul of the disciple. Second, in this specific case, the Imam does not examine the actions of, the, of a lay person, but one of the most learned of his followers. Third, the Imam does not rectify the act of Hamad through a verbal teaching, not with words, at least as it, it is suggested by the Hadith, but by actions. And as much as he wished that Hamad performs the prayers in front of him, the Imam was inclined also to put the correct teaching in show and action. Fourth, Hamad's encounter with the Imam bears the traces of a mode of teaching that is underestimated by researchers, namely the non-verbal teaching of the Imams. The Imams used to communicate their, their knowledge through speech, truth, but also did not miss the relevance of showing their followers the correct conduct by mainly performing it in front of their eyes. Reversibly, the followers of the Imams learned much information from such actions. Reporting the deeds of the Imams is a well-known part of Hadith Corpus, and these actions were taken to be part of the Sunnah that has an authoritative impact on deriving legal rulings. And these actions are themselves instances of non-verbal teaching, since the Imam does not utter any spoken word. The probativity, hujjiyya, of such actions are dealt with by, non, by scholars of usul, who in fact invoke the description of such incidents as non-verbal legal arguments. Dalil al-shari ghair al Moreover, hadith is loaded with non-verbal impressions, gestures, or body movements of the imams. The transmitters of hadith had arguably found that such information is helpful for conveying an implicit message that is much needed for a complete understanding. The conceptualization of the imam's teaching, seen from the verbal and non-verbal duality in hadith, is represented in the display chart, and I will be focusing on the left side, on the non-verbal teachings and the gestures. Examining these examples incite a number of research questions. Why do such pieces of information appear in hadith? In which way do they affect the verbal meaning? Why do transmitters keep such information? And do they differ in their interests? Did they keep all the observations? How do compilers of hadith gather this information and interpret it? How can we read such accounts from the point of view of modern linguistics? For example, with the speech act theory, pragmatics, stylistics, and other things. And just to give you an example how linguistic studies can inform such approaches, here is the results of Mehrabian in his classical study of nonverbal communication, where we see that nonverbal components constitute a major part of any message. Any message uh, has 55% of its con content in a nonverbal way, non non, uh, uh, in actions. Starting first with the reports on Imam's actions, example of such hadith bear linguistic uh, features employing verbs and expressions related to watching and observing on the part of the transmitter. The most recurrent one is, on, is the verb ra'aytu, I saw. As this example, again from Hamad. Hamad is reporting uh, a specific action done by Imam al kafi as you can see, the Imam does not speak any word. It's just that the Imam went to, uh, to the Kaaba, did tawaf and prayer, and left. That's all. As stated, my question is, how can we understand this report beyond its legal authority, namely as an incident of nonverbal learning? Hamad here seems to be speaking for, for some audience, either in a learning environment where he is teaching them the correct actions of the Imam, or in a polemical context where his testimony supports a certain ritual point. Be this as it may, we see, that we see that the Imam does not utter any word. In this mode of teaching, it is rather the student's responsibility to gather the details of the action in question attentively. The learning process, in other words, relies on the disciple's initiative. He must have been attentive at the moment the Imam performs certain action, and he must recall his observation later in specific and suitable context. One relevant point is that the Imam seems to be aware, in some cases, of the fact that a companion or two are attentively watching his acts. And if we accept this, it can be said that the Imams wished for such actions, in fact, to prompt questions on the part of their followers. Now we move to the second major component of nonverbal teachings of the Imams preserved in Imami Hadith, namely the gestures and signs of the Imams combined to their verbal teachings. 
This theme, this theme, as far as secondary literature is concerned, was first examined by the famous Orientalist uh, Ignaz Goldseer. In a primitive yet interesting short communication, he showed the relevance of this body language in understanding hadith reports attributed, attributed to the Prophet in Sunni collections. Several examples of hand gestures are included in Imami hadith collections. These nonverbal components serve various purposes according to the broader context of the report. Consider first this hadith. Zurara is recalling a certain legal ruling revealed by Imam al-Baqir. It's about Adda, the, the uh, waiting period after temporary marriage. The Imam is saying that the waiting period is 45 days, but he, uh, I mean, the ruling includes a numeral information that al-Baqir displays visually with hands. He was aqada biyadayh, as the, the text says. This, mo this method is called hisab al-aqd. And basically, this, this is the method. Uh, it's a general hint um, on representing numbers with fingers according to this medieval method. It's no longer used. So, for example, when Imam Aqada biyadayh 45, so probably this, this is the gesture. Zurara was referring to this form. The Imam was doing 40 and 5. Yeah? This mode of visual representation is added to this hadith in remembering, he is remembering, to enhance the legal position it supports. Zurara not only heard the Imam providing the information, but also saw it. The Imam usage of his hand to show the legal information to his disciple is much telling on the way he helped them memorizing this particular position. Arguably, this additional helping method was taking recourse to since the topic is considered of certain relevance by the Imam. Moreover, the disciple, re-mentioning of the gesture in verbal terms to his own students is also instructive to his immediate entourage on two levels authenticating his testimony and passing the information further in the same way he received it once. Other significant cases show that mims and face impressions, for instance, are used to modify the verbal information or to condition it in some way or another. In this report about the Ba'ah Ahl al-Kitab, the Imam is giving a certain information yet with a remarkable face impression that caught the attention of the transmitter. So he's saying, yeah, you can consume this, but he's saying this like, yeah, you can consume. Yeah, that's the falawa yeah? shidqah. Uh, he twisted his jaw bone. No, I took 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. OK, we have uh, two minutes. I'll, two I'll minutes take two minutes. Already. I have two pages. Okay. Yeah? One way to understand the relevance of the facial impression recorded in the tradition is to read the, te is to read the text without it. Try to read the text without this information. Had Bashir, the, the, the transmitter of this hadith, did not preserve the information that the Imam informed him with a twisted jawbone, the legal ruling supported by the tradition would be understood differently. But the transmitter is intentionally adding this part to make his reader aware of that there is something wrong in here. Yeah? Another example that I will not be uh, able to mention, but like for example here, it's about zakat, and we have the information, an incomplete information. The, the, the Imam Saad is saying, do not pay zakat for every, and then he makes, he, he qala biyadihi, yeah, has that. So it, it doesn't say anything. Yeah. I also skipped this one and jumped to the conclusions. I mean, uh, four main roles or features of this nonverbal teaching can be, uh, um, can be summarized here. First, these nonverbal teachings are explicative. They show the right performance. They are mixed with verbal communication for a clearer meaning. They are provocative. They intensify the educational encounter and render the disciple more attentive and prompt the learning process. They are replacive, totally or partially. They substitute verbal words, and in certain cases, the message cannot be understood without them. And finally, they are regulative in the sense that they signal the, in the intensity of the learning process. Here are some uh, secondary sources on this topic. So there are a few. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for such uh, an interesting topic. Actually, and nonverbal uh, teaching are very important because are going to be similar to a taqlid nowadays we are going to follow. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Now we move to yes. the now fifth uh, to article. Assistant Prof. Dr. Maryam Dweikh, uh, the portrayal of uh, tolerance and empathy in selected orations of Imam Ali, a pragma stylistic study. Yes, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, dear attendants. 
uh, I'm happy to be among you. I, I'm actually blessed to be one of the researchers. And I hope you all find something interesting or something worthy of your time and attention. Okay? But first of all, I want to say that there has been some modification to the title. Okay? The title has been modified to the, the portrayal of tolerance and empathy in the covenant of Imam Ali to Malik al Ashtad, a pragmatic stylistic study. Okay? Okay. So, you know, Imam Ali, peace be upon him, wrote a covenant to or a document to Malik al Ashtar when he appointed him as the ruler of Egypt and the surrounding areas. Most of the covenant has been located or focused on what the rights and the duties of Muslim and non Muslim. So, this study tries to investigate this product from a pragma stylistic study. It aims at clarifying or identifying the strategies, the pragmatic strategies, actually, employed by Imam Ali, peace be upon him, in order to pinpoint his style. Also, another aim is that is to shed light on the relationship between pragmatic and stylistic as two fields of study that have much in common. So, first of all, I want to say something about pragmatics. So, pragmatics is concerned with the speaker meaning. Or, uh, you know, people rarely say what they mean. They left a great deal of, they, of what they mean to be inferred by the addressing. So, it, it focuses on the context. If I give you an example, an utterance, the boys have arrived. This could have different meanings, depending on different contexts. First of all, it could be said by a parent hosting a party to announce that it is time to serve the cake. Or it could be uttered by a mafia boss to warn someone. Or it could be said by a thief to his partner to warn him that the police have come to the scene. So the meaning depends on the context. In its narrow sense, pragmatics concern with how listener arrive at the speaker intended meaning. And it is the broadest sense how it deals with the general principles followed by human beings when they interact with each other. Okay? As for the second parameters in my study, which is stylistic. Stylistic basically means the relationship between language and literature. This is in its basic sense. However, it deals with how meaning created through language by employing certain choices, okay? And using the models and the theory of linguistic as analytical tool to explore how the text work as it does, okay? As for the pragma stylistic, it is what? It is interaction between two fields of study. We have the pragmatics and stylistic. So since the pragmatics concerned with meaning in use, stylistic tries to employ the theories of a pragmatics to explore some of the problems of literary text in general. So the reader is not a passive recipient, okay? So the text will not mean the same thing to all readers. It, the readers will interpret it differently, okay? Yes. So pragma stylistic move from concern or focus on the linguistic form to concern with what? With how the pragmatic interpretation changes according to what? To the communicative intention of the speaker. This is the pragma stylistic. It is a hybrid, hybrid field of study. It is interdisciplinary between two fields of study. Context, as I said, is very important. It is, we can't conduct a pragmatic study without taking context into consideration. 
There is a note in student cafeteria says that self-clearing cafeteria. What does that mean? One might expect the plates on the cups to, clear, to put themselves away, okay? But the majority of students will understand that it means that the customers has to clear up their cups and plates. How the student understands such a thing? It is not related to the linguistic expression itself. It is related to their common sense and their knowledge of the world. So this is the issues that, has been, that have been tackled in pragmatics. Now I'll go to the main topic, which is tolerance. Yes, really? <coughs> tolerance. This is the main topic of it. Tolerance, there are two conceptualization of tolerance. Some regard prejudice as a prerequisite for tolerance. This means that you can't be tolerant unless you have been prejudiced. Another conceptualization has nothing to do with prejudice. It means that it is a value orientation toward differences. It comprises three elements. It, it has to do what? Acceptance, respect, and appreciation of diversity. This is the, the conceptualization I depend on it. It means what? Acceptance, respect, and appreciation of diversity. This means that you have to accept each other, yeah, accept the differences, regardless of their sources. This is mean, why we resort to tolerance? Why? Because in order to avoid aggression, okay? And sometimes in communication, we have failures, okay? In order to fix such failures, we resort to what? To tolerance. Actually, being tolerant is not an easy task. This means that to accept the views, the beliefs of others, even those that are conflicting with your own. This is require what? It's not an easy task. Require understanding, endurance, and persistent effort to on the part of the individual, okay? This means that to be fair on even the thing you don't like, you have to accept them, okay? I'll go to the conclusion. Yes. <laughs> so regarding the data, I have selected six examples, okay? I selected four as illustrative, okay? This one, just look at it. It's yani, regarding the pragmatic issues, we have speech acts, we have maximum observance, and in lectures, we have politeness strategies, and we have troops. And the conclusion, the analysis reveals that Imam Ali style in the covenant to Malik al Ashtar is dis distinguished by the use of a spectrum of pragmatic strategies utilized to portray the theme of tolerance and empathy. For instance, speech acts are used to achieve certain effects and influence on the hearer. The conversational maxim are floated to generate lectures, which instigate the hearer to infer the intended meaning. Politeness strategies are resorted to to show respect and the troop are employed to enhance the effectiveness of the text. And this is the most important conclusion I have arrived at. On the basis of the findings, it can be said that in spite of the fact that the covenant, the covenant was written a long time ago, it is loaded with instance of strategies and values that are associated with tolerance, respect, and appreciation of others among individuals. It also serves as a manifestation of Imam Ali's persistent devotion to the spread of humanity, justice, acceptance, and building a community where basic human rights, including freedom of speech, religion, and profession, are guaranteed. And thank you for Thank listening. you very much, Dr. Maryam, for uh, this lecture and on this article. Uh, now we move to the sixth uh, article. Uh, that is uh, Dr. Manar Karim Mahdi, uh, Al Qasim uh, University, Babylon. A cognitive stylistic uh, perspective of Imam Ali's Kumayyad supplication. My uh, paper is entitled A Cognitive Stylistic Perspective 
of um, Imam Ali's Kumail supplication. Now, um, recently, the uh, cognitive uh, science uh, has revolutionized, uh, revolutionized different research areas, and uh, it has impacted science and literature. And uh, this revolu revolution has resulted in different uh, and disciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary research areas. One of them is uh, cognitive stylistics. Now, uh, cognitive stylistics uh, is broadly defined as the cognitive study of style. Uh, this type of research area uh, endeavors to scrutinize texts through um, examining the application of cognitive theories uh, and cognitive linguistics to enhance the understanding and interpretation of texts. The current research paper sets itself the task of answering the following question. What kind of cognitive stylistic features are implemented in Imam Ali's Kumail publication? Uh, and how cognitive stylistic concepts uh, enhance the interpretation of this kind of text. As such, the paper aims at identifying the cognitive stylistic features implemented in uh, Imam Ali's Kumail supplication by uh, uh, adopting the threefold model of Jeffries and McIntyre 2010, encompassing schema theory, cognitive metaphors, as well as conceptual, uh, contextual frames theory. First of all, we have to, to say something about supplication. If we want to define supplication, we can say that it is the act of entreating the uh, divine being for the pardon of guilt and the liberation from sense bondage. Linguistically speaking, to supplicate means to uh, ask in a very, or, or to beg in a very humble, uh, humble manner, uh, usually from a, a superior or someone in power. Concerning Imam Ali's Kumail supplication, we can say that it is one of the uh, uh, or it is the best supplication, as uh, said by al alam al-Majlisi. Uh, it is distinguished by its extreme humility, uh, acceptance of a human weakness, and unwavering faith in divine mercy. Concerning the uh, cogn uh, cognitive stylistic analysis of uh, Kumail's supplication, we said that we have um, analyzed uh, this application according to uh, cognitive metaphor theory, schema theory, and contextual frames theory. First of all, we have cognitive metaphors. Uh, now, within this theory, uh, we have abstract concepts that are often uh, understood through metaphorical mappings to more concrete concepts. So we have uh, uh, something abstract that is likened to something uh, concrete. Uh, in Dua Kumail, uh, we have uh, metaphors of power uh, related to Almighty Allah, uh, and we have metaphors of weakness related to human beings. Uh, an example we have وَبِجَبَرُوتِكَ أَلَّتِي غَلَبْتَ بِهَا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَبِعَزَّتِكَ الَّتِي لَا يَقُومُ لَهَا شَيْءٍ وَبِعَظَمَتِكَ الَّتِي مَلَأَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ So we have abstract concepts that are likened or explained by more concrete concepts. So we have عَظَمَتِكَ uh, which is something abstract, link, uh, likened or linked to something more concrete like مَلَأْتَ بِهَا كُلَّ شيء. Uh, And we have also metaphors cognitive metaphors of uh, forgiveness and sin. Uh, like, for example, when uh, the imam says, Allahumma ighfir liya dhunub allati tahtuk al-isam. Allahumma ighfir liya dhunub allati tunzil al-niqam. Allahumma ighfir liya dhunub allati tughayyir al-ni'am. Allahumma ighfir liya dhunub allati tahbis al-du'a. So as we can see, something uh, that is abstract is uh, 
uh, described or explained or referred to by something more concrete. So we have guilt, uh, we have the noob, that, uh, and then uh, these uh, guilts are uh, described as tahbis dua as if they are something concrete. And there are so many other examples. Uh, let us say something about schema theory. The uh, supplication implements schema theory. Uh, schema theory implies or uh, uh, depends on, on mental models or structures that aid in the organization and interpretation of texts. Uh, and uh, the supplication makes you use of well non theological frameworks of schemas. We have a mental model that is completely suitable for a supplication or a prayer in uh, religious discourse. Now, we have examples of schemas, like, for example, a schema uh, for uh, hell and heaven. Uh, for example, we have um, descriptions of hell. Like with the triggers, linguistic triggers like annar, yuhriqahu lahibaha, zafiraha, zabaniyataha, and the like. Other examples of schemas, we have uh, the imam saying, Allahumma inni as'aluka su'ala man ishtaddat faqada. So we should have a background knowledge of someone who is in a true poverty, asking for money or asking for food in order to interpret and uh, understand this uh, phrase. Uh, or when the Imam says, buka al So we, have, we should have a schema or mental model for someone who lost um, a, a dear person uh, and is uh, crying. So these are examples of schemas implemented in the supplication. Uh, finally, we have contextual frames. Now, within this theory, we have uh, the uh, uh, the notion that a word or a phrase, a phrase's meaning is uh, uh, dependent on the context in which it is used, and we can never understand its full meaning or implicit meaning without knowing the uh, uh, context or the environment in which this uh, phrase is said. Now, uh, the supplication implements the language and cultural conventions that are uh, uh, familiar to uh, religious discourse and that are well known to the target audience. To sum up, um, cognit cognitive stylistic analysis of Imam Ali's Kumail supplication has revealed that uh, cognitive uh, devices uh, and cognitive theories like metaphor, cognitive metaphor schema, and contextual uh, frames uh, are usefully utilized in religious discourse in general and in Imam uh, Ali's uh, supplication, Kumail supplication in a specific. More precisely, the hypothesis set at the beginning of the work, which reads cognitive metaphors are the uh, most prevalent cognitive stylistic uh, element implemented in Dua Kumail supplication, Afwan in Kumail supplication, has been validated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much Dr. Manar, for uh, such a presentation. Actually, Dua Kumail is going to be full of many teachings and uh, uh, attractions that are going to be beneficial for the Muslims. And thanks for such presentation. Now we move to the seventh, uh, seventh article. article. Uh, Dr. Maasuma Abadar Jawad. Uh, she's a doctor and lecturer in the Department of English, College of Education for Human Sciences. General major is linguistics, and specialist one is, or special one, is the critical pragmatics. Uh, the scope of interest is stylistics, critical discourse analysis, and the critical pragmatics. She has four uh, published papers, critical pragmatic analysis of women, oppression, the pragmatics of slogans and cards. Uh, and a critical discourse analysis of oppression uh, in To Kill a Mockingbird, the Pragmatics of Slogans and Cars, a stylistic study of English Catholic dead or death prayers. Uh, her her uh, paper is entitled uh, A Stylistic Rhetorical Analysis of Reformation in Imam al Hussein Selected War Speeches. Yes, uh, the paper of my, uh, the title of my paper is uh, a stylistic rhetorical analysis 
of Imam Hussein formation in selected war speeches. Well, uh, this study investigates the use of different rhetorical and stylistic strategies used by Imam Hussein, peace upon him, and some of his uh, speeches before and within Karbala's battle. Uh, the main aims of this study is uh, to reveal the impact of the use of uh, these uh, stylistic and rhetorical strategies and how uh, Imam Hussein uses these stylistic and rhetorical strategies for influencing his audience and to uh, help them to reform themselves. So uh, the main aim of Imam Hussein was to reform his audience religiously, politically, socially, uh, and culturally, and uh, in every possible way. So the data of this study is uh, Imam Hussein war speeches uh, before going to Karbala when he was in Medina, and uh, in Karbala when he was going to fight against, uh, against his enemies in the battle. Uh, he has two speeches in Karbala. So uh, three speeches will be, uh, I have analyzed the three speeches to find out how Imam Hussein uses different rhetorical and stylistic strategies for reforming uh, his enemies. Actually, he did not hate those enemies. He wanted to reform them. He wanted to change them to be better. Yes, uh, so uh, this study hypothesized that Imam Hussein uses these uh, rhetorical strategies of ethos, pathos, logos, he uses them. Uh, and the ethos is related to the morality side. Uh, pathos is related to side related to the passions, emotions, and logos is related to what is related to reason and to mind, to uh, rationality. So he uses these strategies. Uh, Besides, he uses some stylistic strategies to help him in order to uh, to influence his audience. Uh, to help uh, to help them to change themselves and maybe they will change their mind and and will stop standing for the injustice and will fight with him against Yazid. Yes, so he uses stylistic strategies of uh, linguistic deviation and linguistic parallelism. Well, before anything, uh, stylistics, uh, uh, re uh, firstly, rhetorical study or rhetorics, deals mainly with the effective strategies used by uh, a speaker in order to influence his audience. While stylistics deal with the how, also stylistics is somehow is related to rhetorics. Stylistics deals with the, how people create uh, creative text and how they use different types of deviation, linguistic deviation, phonetic, grammatical, uh, uh, and uh, how they use parallelism and other types of devices in order to uh, influence or impact the audience. Yes, so Imam Hussein uses these strategies in order to influence his audience. Yes, uh, the main concept of this study is reformation. Reformation uh, deals with the trying is the process of changing people or the society into a better one. It is the process of uh, helping people to change their lives, to improve them, and it's a social one, it can be political one, religious one, cultural one. Yes. Uh, so, yes. The methodology of this study Yes, the study follows, uh, of course, I followed a qualitative method of analysis. And this study is based on our, our total classification of ethos, patho, uh, pathos, and logos. It is also based on Leach 1969 model, a classification of linguistic deviation, and also a short classification of linguistic parallelism. Yes, this is the model of my study. And I have analyzed the three texts, just like I have said before. The first text is by Imam Hussein. Uh, the, uh, the first speech, Imam Hussein's speech, night, uh, uh, sorry, Imam Hussein's speech the uh, in the night of his departure from 
مكة in Saudi Arabia to Kufa in Iraq. And it is it start with Alhamdulillah wa MashaAllah wa la quwwata illa billah خطة الموت على ولد آدم وخطة القلادة على جيد الفتاة وما أولهني إلى أسلافي اشتياق يعقوب إلى يوسف and to the end of this speech this is the first speech and I have and I have attempted to to I have tried to find out how Imam Hussein uses ethos pathos and logos in this speech okay for example Imam Hussein uses in his firstly Logo strategy by trying to show people that death is the natural end for every human being. So when we are supposed to die at the end, so let us die for a real cause. So he's trying firstly to use ration and rationality to convince them. Then he uses also, he uses uh, different types of parallelism and different types of deviation. Parallelism, it means uh, the use of repetition the use of the same words or the use of the words with the same grammatical structure in order to influence the audience. For example, Alhamdulillah, wa masha'Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. You can see that they are parallel structures. And also he uses deviation. For example, he uses simile sometimes. He uses uh, rhetorical questions. For example, asking them questions that they already know their, its answer. He uses uh, personification, he uses intertextuality. Imam Hussein uses a lot of Quranic verses in order to convince his audience. So all of these are what are stylistic strategies, right? Yes, so this is, firstly he uses ethos strategies, then he uses in the same speech, pathos strategies by trying to appeal to their emotions. Uh, okay, for example, through anticipating the way he will be killed. So he he show us how he will be killed by saying that وَخَيْرٌ لِي مَصْرَعٌ أنا أُلَاقِيهِ كَأَنِّي بِأَوْصَالِ يَتَقَطَّعُهَا أَسْلَانِ الْفَلَوَاتِ بَيْنَ النَّوَاوِيسَ وَكَرْبَلَاءَ So he's trying to use, to uh, appeal to their emotions, okay? Uh, rather than the rational side. Yes. So he also uses deviation by using metaphor through referring to those who will kill him uh, and uh, using animal, showing that how the animals will kill him, will eat of his flesh after his death. So this is what, this is imagery. Yes, okay. So the second, sorry. Yes, the second speech is uh, the analysis of the second speech, Imam Hussein's speech in Ashura's day, while he was fighting the, ar the army that was sent against him. Now this is the second speech. The second speech starts with, with أيها الناس اسمعوا قولي ولا تعجلوا حتى أعظكم بما يحق علي لكم وحتى أعذر إليكم. Yes. So uh, here he used also different uh, rhetorical strategies. Uh, for example, he uses فانسبوني وانظروا من أنا ثم ارجعوا إلى أنفسكم وعاتبوها فانظروا هل يصلح لكم قتلي وانتهاك حرمتي. Here he's using what? He's using rationality. Ask yourself, is it possible to kill? the grandson uh, of the messenger or the prophet Muhammad. This is what, this is uh, uh, logo strategy. He's talking to, to them rationally, okay? He also uses her ethos strategy heavily by uh, trying to show them the moral aspect that this is not mor morally possible. Yes, in the third speech, Imam Hussein, yes. In the third speech, Imam Hussein was really angry of those people because they really decided to kill Imam Hussein and they did not change their mind a little bit. So he was angry of them. And he started with that. تَبَّنْ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الْجَمَاعَةُ وَتَرْحَى وَبُؤْسًا لَكُمْ وَتَعْسَى حِينَ اسْتَصْرَخْتُمُونَ وَالِهِينَ فَأَصْرَخْنَاكُمْ مُجِفِينَ فَشَحَدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا سَيْفًا كَانَ فِي أَيْدِينَا So here in this speech, Imam Hussein uses mainly uh, patho, patho strategy, because he was really angry and he, he was trying to show his emotions. Yes, and he also uses different stylistic strategies within these three stages of ethos, pathos, and logo. He uses different stylistic strategies like uh, intertextuality, interdiscursivity, by using different Quranic verses. Yes, and finally, coming to the conclusions, 
the study conclude that Imam Hussein uses different rhetorical strategies that are ethos, pathos, and logos for achieving the impact, uh, and they also uses stylistic strategies for reforming people. Yes, Imam Hussein uses uh, uh, yes, Imam Hussein uses stylistic strategies of syntactic parallelism by using parallel structures. He uses also lexical parallelism, especially repetition and uh, parallel lexical items for achieving the impact related to logos, pathos, and ethos strategies to convince people to follow the right path and stand against injustice. Yes, and that is all what I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masuma, for such a presentation. Uh, the title of this article is Examining the Instances of the Quran's Healing Power in the Narrations of Imam al Qasim, Peace be upon him. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Gratitude to the committee of this conference, especially Al-Atabat al-Abbasiyah. And let's see what is going on here. We have, I have, my uh, title is about the examining of instance of Quran healing, Quran's healing power in the narration of Imam Qasim. As you know, we have a lot of attributes and sifats about Quran. The Quran, the divine scripture revealed, revealed, revealed to the Prophet Muhammad is in due with unique and unparalleled quality such as guidance. As you know, at the Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, this attribute is uh, attribute to the Quran guidance. Hudan lil muttaqin remembrance. Laqad anzal alaykum alaykum fihi kitab fihi zikrukum criterion. Tabarak al lazi nazal al furqan ala abdihi furqan criterion min Quran clarification meaning tabyan al kull shay. And one of the most significant and eternal attributes about Quran is this uh, attribute, it's Shafa. What is the meaning of Shafa? As you know, Shafa could be translated into cure of disease. Elaj al-Amras, for example. The Quran, the scripture, Shafa is mentioned in three key verses. Uh, as you know, at the Surah Al-Isra, verse 82, we send down a Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers. And O oh mankind, there has come to you instruction from your Lord. Link for what is in your breeds. And in Surah Al Fasilat, verse 44. It's uh, one of the most important attribute and sifat about Quran as in mentioned in Quran itself. Let's look at, at the meaning of Shafa in perspective on commentators, the distinguished commentator Mufassirin. For example, Ortobi said the Quran comprehensive healing is talking about offer cure the both spiritual and physical ailments, meaning both of al-ruhi wal-jismani, in shifa al-ruhi wal-jismani lil-Qur'an. And the Qur'an notion of shifa in capacities, as Allah Taba Taba said, a multifaceted understanding of well-being. He explained that the Qur'an views healing in a holistic manner, addressing not just physical ailments, but also ailment and sickness of heart, mind, and soul. As you can see in the perspectives of commentators and mufassirin. But when we look at, at the narrations of our infallible Imam, especially Imam Qasim, there is a dif different between that was uh, interpreted by Mufassirun, as we see in the first hadith, Imam said, 
في القرآن شفاء من كل داء امام انكلود شفاء from the just the literal meaning to the all kind of sickness and disease it's very important it's uh, معنى شامل يعني meaning uh, uh, dynamic uh, meaning for the Quran in, in terms of Shafa. And in another narration, Imam Qasim said, إِذَا خِفْتَ أَمْرًا فَقَرَ أَمْعَتَ آيَةٍ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ If you fear something, recite ten verses of Quran from whatever you want. ثُمَّا قُلْ اللَّهُمْ مَكْشِفْ أَنَّ الْبَلَى ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ Then you can sit, اللَّهُمْ مَكْشِفْ أَنَّ الْبَلَى يَا اللَّهُ dispel uh, this uh, disease and this uh, adversity from me ten, ten times. And in another verses, Imam, uh, one of the companions, Imam, Imam Muhammad ibn Rabah al Qala, uh, he saw Imam as one to do hijama, al hijama copying at the day of Friday. Imam said, قبل الحجامة you should recite آيات الكورسي it, 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 it meaning uh, by reciting آيات الكورسي your body coming and be better and have a healthy and I want to summarize my uh, article in two parts the first one is the first issue is healing the quality of Quran in both psychological and physical illness, which is in the narration narrated from Imam al Qasim. Both aspects of Quran have been addressed with recitation of specific chapters like Ma'avazatain, Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, Qul Awudhu Ben Nans, Qul Awudhu Rabb Nas, and specific verses like Ayatul Kursi. And in both of الروحي والمعنوي والجسماني يعني psychological and physical illness it includes both of them and the second part of this, in, this particle concluded that the healing quality of Quran includes both preventive يعني الوقاية دون العلاج الوقاية and curative aspects prevent, prevention from the pain Pain and afflictions means that by reciting certain, certain verses of Quran, one can prevent unexpected harms and the progression and increase of pain and affliction. And this meaning has been emphasized on most cases in the narration of Imam al Qasim. I hope it would be useful for you. Thank you so much. That's enough. Thank you very much. Murtaza for uh, such an article that is going to talk about Shifa in the Holy Quran. As we know, the Holy Quran is going to be uh, to recover all the illness of the human being, but we are going to, uh, unfortunately, we are not going to do so. Thank you very much, Dr. Murtaza. Yes, the assist uh, le uh, lecturer, Zuha uh, Fadal Abbas, University of Babylon. Representation of Linguistic Landscape in Iraqi Religious Area, a Social Semiotic Study. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Actually, it is pleased and honorable to be with uh, one of the participants in this, uh, in the second uh, uh, conference of, and uh, the second version of uh, Imamate Conference. And my special thanks for Professor Dr. Haida for granted us this opportunity to participate in this conference. Uh, first, I'd like to note that uh, my title has been modified into Representation of Linguistic Landscape of Imam Hussein Praya in Arafah, a Social Semiotic Study. This study explores the linguistic interpretation of Imam Hussein Praya in Arafah in which it examines the complex layers of meaning through the lens of social semiotic theory. And the crucial Islamic prayer connected to Imam Hussein is the day of Arafah. It 
is one of the prominence a prayer of Imam Hussein, peace be upon, upon him, which has significant spiritual, cultural, and, so, and social implications. This study aims to reveal how language, meaning, and social context interact by applying social semiotics. The study organized around social semiotics elements found in the prayer, such as uh, the language selections, imagery, and symbolic illusions. These components are broken down into uh, and, uh, wants to show how they support the formation of uh, communal values, religious identity, and collective memory. The study also examines how prayer helps perceive cultural her heritage and improve social observation among generations. The results show that the use of particular vocabulary, words, metaphors, and story patterns draws attention to how a prayer expresses a sense of community and spiritual commitment. The research has uh, certain aims. One of the aim and the, the main aim of uh, the study examining the role of religious language plays in the linguistic environment of religious gathering, focusing on the Imam Hussein prayer in Arabic celebrations, and determining how religious language affects, uh, affects how the lang linguistic environment of religious occurrence and uh, its portrayal, and finally determining the visual semiotic mode inside the religious events language environment. The term linguistic landscape refers to the visibility and the prominence of written language in public and private settings as in neighborhood cities, uh, regions, variety of signs and texts, such as in row signs, uh, storefronts, advertisements, public signs, posters, and graffitis, as well as uh, badges and logos of political and religious organization which creates a rich linguistic tapestry. The linguistic landscape of a city neighborhood is a testament to the intricate interaction and linguistic <clears throat> influence that arise from the linguistic diversity in many parts of the world. As far as our concern of the study is a social semantic study, so it's important to note, uh, to have uh, some idea about Social semiotic analysis, which is the study of actual discourse practice, how they are expressed in text as human language statements, and how they are arranged along a continuum of this continuum of discourse and in various connections across different modalities. So social semiotics study has historically uh, used register, genre, text function, and text meaning to describe these interactions. It also examines how these ideas are used to, for uh, intentional communication, how social and communicative limitations affect uh, those communicative modes and semiotic decisions and tract, and how vital processes are in text production, use, and circulation. So the semiotic tools used in Imam Hussein prayer further highlight the interaction, the interaction between tradition and innovation. The prayer has its roots in scripture and historical traditions. So it is found in the past and has its uh, applying application in the present time. So it is adjust, <clears throat> adjust the current setting to ensure its applicable, applicability and resonance with listeners today, nowadays. This versatility demonstrates the prayer's lasting ability to convey profound spiritual and social significance to people of various ages and cultures. The methodology used in this research, applying Chris and Van Leeuwen uh, <coughs> model of uh, 2006, which is based on analyzing according to mode, design, information structure, social semiotics, and other elements. The, one of the samples I have analyzed for 
four, four images. I have analyzed four images that uh, has uh, the prayer of Imam Hussein in Arafah. One of them is, Allahumma ij'alni akhshaka ka'anni araak wa as'idni bitaqwaak wa la tashqini bimaqsiyatik. So the analysis of this sample shows the representational or experiential meaning. One of them is the processes which is used in the uh, prayer, which is the act of supplication to God using verbs just like akhshak, araak, I see you make, uh, or as edni make me happy, and so on. The participants in this prayer, is the, the, the primary participants in the prayer is the speaker, which is Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, addressing God. The image depict the, the, depicts the participants, pilgrims, engaged in the act of a prayer. And the uh, circumstances in this image is the, are implied through the setting day of Arafah and religious context of prayer. The interactive or interpersonal meaning in this piece of prayer is contact, which is the figure gazing upwards, possibility towards to, to heaven, in which they are gazing towards heaven, and in direct form of engagement with the viewer. And the social distance, the image establishes a sense of proximity among pilgrims, and the attitude, which is the angle and the positioning of the central figure to convey a sense of devotion and humility. Finally, the compositional or textual meaning, which contains the information value in which the text at, at the top of the ball and, and in, in bold black ground immediately captures attention, which indicates an importance. And the salience <clears throat> in which uh, the participants in the image are uh, uh, clothing in, in white clothing of the pilgrims and the clear blue sky are usually circling, drawing attention to the participants and the spiritual context. And the framing of the image, it is framed in such a way that it directs the viewer focus towards the central figure of the text, creating cohesive and visual message. So, the analysis has integrated, uh, combining the, the, two, uh, f the two of the framework, which is the image and the text together, convey a profound message of religious devotion and the reciprocal nature of divine human relationship, which is, tries to focus. The <clears throat> visual elements with the man engaging in a prayer at the shrine set a context of scaredness and devotion. To be concluded with, so, in social semantic analysis with those pieces of a prayer, this study has explored the, the complex levels of meaning that the prayer's language and symbols communicate, emphasizing the religious and societal relevance. And by implying social semantic theory, we have decoded how these language components communicate power, identity within the prayer setting. The examination showed that Imam Hussein prayer linguistic selections are not coincidental, but they are deeply rooted within the community, and I mean the religious community and cultural context. Using particular words, phrases, and rhetorical devices, which highlights the prayer function in expressing shared values and beliefs. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karadaha. Uh, now we have reached to the uh, to the end of the session. Actually, we have uh, found or we have discussed uh, nine articles uh, that three of them are have dealt with the, the teachings of Imam Al Kazim, peace be upon him. Two of them have dealt with the uh, teachings of Imam Ali, peace be upon him, and one of them is about Imam Al Hussein here. And other, some, of the, and some of the articles have dealt with some linguistic and rhetorical uh, aspects that are dealing with the religious uh, aspects of the saying of uh, imams. Uh, most of them have uh, uh, dealing with such things. Uh, we have uh, some other articles that have dealt with the uh, Islamic uh, 
interpretation or tafsir or ta'weed, as dealt with the Dr. Liaqid. And uh, we have talked about the role of nonverbal uh, action in teaching uh, the Muslims to with their action. Now we move to the, uh, if there are any questions yes. uh, yes, question for the audience, question. to the researchers. Yes, Dr. Hassan. Assalamu alaikum again. Alaikum assalam. Okay. In fact, I have a couple of questions for both researchers. Dr. Menar, I think, with the cognitive, and Dr. Masoom. Let us start with Dr. Menar. Uh, Dr. Menar, I think this is evening, right? Good evening. <laughs> okay. What do you mean by cognitive stylistics? Okay, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, cognitive stylistics is the application of uh, cognitive theories or cognitive, yes? Well, theories from which we can elect uh, models. Uh, yes. I beg your pardon. I couldn't find any model in the theories you have said. There yeah, are mere there theories, is, yeah. you know, and you have talked about McLean-Chair, right? And Mental what? McLean-Chair, I think. Ma Jeffries and McIntyre. Jeffries and McIntyre. 2010. These, are, the, these guys or these people are interested mainly in stylistics rather than in cognitive stylistics. Yes, they have a chapter in their book entitled Stylistics and Cognition. I can give you the I, book. I know, the, I know that book, by the way. Yes. Me, myself, I teach cognitive Dr. stylistics. Dr. Hassan here, if you are going to summarize your question, please. <laughs> yes, OK. Uh, so the other question is, you said cognitive features. Yes, cognitive stylistic features. So we have models, features, and stylistics. Yes. What is this? We have features within texts. Okay, so we are going. What features? Sorry, again, doctor. Cognitive stylistic features. And what about the models? So we have stylistic features and we have cognitive features. What we are analyzing here is cognitive stylistic again, features. Again, what do you mean by features? What? Features are. The up, the, you yeah, know, features, the stylistic the problem build for me, up. Sorry. The problem for me is the features themselves. When you entered or you inserted the features to the whole model or to, to the theories you are after, it became vague or blurry. I'm not sure what's, what you are after. Okay, uh, another thing. Do you think that there is a suitable model to cognitive stylistics? You, your advice, of course. Yeah, of course, there is no one perfect model to apply. Uh, but there are so many useful models to implement in uh, future studies. So all in all, can we agree that cognitive stylistics is something beyond reach right now? Something so, not so easy to handle? Yeah, not so easy, but possible. Okay, good. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much, Dr. Hassan. Have there any other questions here? Yes, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I was so pleased and delighted to hear the uh, lecture by a brother from Iran, Mr. Mohammed Sultani. But at last, I was a bit surprised and astonished not he didn't mention the great uh, Baytul Hikmah, the wisdom house that was during the Abbasid uh, Caliphate, I think uh, during the Ma'mun period. Because all translations of Greek or Roman uh, manuscripts, books, were done, were carried, on, carried out at this house. This is my main concern. Thank Dr. you very much. Thank you very much. For, Dr. Muhammad Sultani, uh, okay, if you don't mind. 
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, you know that uh, this is a famous idea. That actually, it was a famous idea that Baytul Hikmah was responsible for uh, the translation movement. But uh, recent researches has showed that Baytul Hikmah was uh, like a library uh, belonging to the court. It was not the uh, main uh, place for translation movement. I can give you some references. Thank you. OK, thank you. Yes. Concerning uh, the uh, first paper uh, for Dr. Uh, Prof. Dr. Lakat Stack, the role of ethics in Islamic uh, Jeruz uh, jurisprudence, uh, a, Muslim, a Muslim dilemma, yes. I think there was not enough time for, uh, for you, doctor, to explain the research problem. I think there is uh, three-dimensional relations among uh, religion, sharia, and uh, 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 jurisprudence, al-fiqh. Uh, so how can we resolve or, uh, yes, this problem? Our, uh, our ethics have standards that enables them to be alternative to uh, uh, jurisprudence. So that's why some, uh, some uh, rulings that we uh, reject them, mentally reject them, because they can, uh, contrast with what we call al-istihsan al-aqli. Al-usuliyin ya'arfun hadha al-kalam. Yes, so uh, like, for example, al-hila al-shar'iyya. Uh, yes, legal tricks or uh, orga organs uh, transplantation, zara'at al -a'ba. All these, I think, uh, these uh, rulings are rejected by ethics. But uh, for, for, for uh, juris jurisprudence is good. So what is the dilemma here? Yes, Dr. I think Dr. Dela is going to talk about, not about this topic, but about another topic, I think, title, about the tafsir the and the tawil. The title gives sense <laughs> of such relationship. Um, OK, maybe I can stand up. And actually, that was the original title, but yes. then I changed it, because uh, it, for various reasons. I had actually covered that subject in my last book, which was published. I'm not trying to advertise my book. It's called Shiism Revisited in which I trace the whole principles and history of ijtihad. And one of the chapters I covered the role of ethics uh, in inferential uh, deduction, you know, how to get the fatawa. Uh, and like you mentioned, I had quite a few questions, not only about the ethics, but also on usul al-fiqh, which I think is too text-based. This is my own personal um, uh, research. And that there we need more reasoning and ethical deliberation in how we attain uh, in the fatawa, mm -hmm. not only in the examples that you gave, mm -hmm. but I think more important, I have also disturbed some of the fatawa regarding women, for example, mm -hmm. uh, some of fatawa regarding minorities, especially their applicability in modern times. You know, certain laws of fatawa may make sense in a particular period of time. Yes. But of course, there we have sharia and we have fiqh. Yes. And I think that the fiqh part is what disturbs me most. And therefore we need, although we do believe that ours, you know, we use aql mm. as a source of reasoning, but if you follow uh, Muhammad Bakr Sadr and also Mohsin Kadivar and a few others who have now challenged the scholars to reinsert not only reasoning, but also ethical reasoning in our jurisprudential process. But now I'm focused in this paper on um, tafsir. Yeah, I had changed the title some time back, but I think that somehow it got mixed up. Thank you very much. I want to ask uh, Dr. Ali uh, Rida Nazar about his, about his article about nonverbal teaching. Is there any comparison between nonverbal teaching and taqlid in, in Shia uh, teachings? Yeah, what do you mean exactly taqlid by taqlid? Here? Taqlid, like uh, the imitation of a marja? Yeah. yeah. Not really. I can't. I can't relate how how nonverbal teachings can be. Nowadays, uh, all of the Shia are going to yeah. imitate, for example, Sayyid ah. Sistani or uh, yeah. other, for example, uh, uh, like, like our role models. Scholars. So, yeah. Now, well, you have said nonverbal. Sallu kama usalli. The mm. Prophet Muhammad say, Sallu kama usalli. Is it nonverbal? This. 
the saying itself is not uh, it's verbal the saying itself is verbal but the if we find i don't know if you find someone who has no, according to his action not according to his saying no no but this statement sallu kama raitumun this yes, is verbal. Right to yes yeah now if we find someone and we have in sunni tradition for example some reports that the prophet did so and so while he was uh, performing prayers yeah this is non verbal the prophet is not speaking yeah okay thank you very much is there any other question now uh, we are going to end the session thank you very much uh, for uh, listening and for uh, attending the session we thank uh, the holy shrine al abbas holy shrine for uh, doing this uh, conference and we are glad to be here in this uh, whole place thank you very much for uh, the audience for attending the session thanks a lot Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Now it's the time to honor the researchers. And before this moment, I want to shed light on certain viewpoints. You know that the conference takes some hours, but in reality, it takes much. It's an effort of one year. We exert ourselves to collect and garner certain research papers from different parts in the world. Sometimes we target quality, sometimes we target diversity, and sometimes both. For this session, we have great quality and great caliper with the great researchers. And everything here, before dropping the curtain, it should be uttered and should be evident that in the Ahl al-Bayt field, there is no researcher, there is a lover. I mean, love with scientific focus will be great when writing about Ahl al-Bayt. Without such a kind of affection, a kind of edification, there is no effort. That is why here we do appreciate every effort and every attempt and endeavor in the pathway of Ahl al-Bayt. And then we have two kinds of joy. The first time we enjoy yoking all these different diverse researchers all together in one spot of time and place. And at the same time, we enjoy having such a viewpoint, different viewpoints. But the one should be tackled is the idea that every researchers and every papers having the idea of on board. Everyone here attends and will leave on board. We are in total agreement about Ahl al-Bayt. And this is one of the main places of the conference. Now it's the time to honor the researchers, the time to show them appreciation and respect for their efforts. So I do call Mr. Engineer Talal Alpir, the consultant of the general secretary in the whole Abbas Shrine to have the uh, rostrum to appreciate the researchers. Welcome, Dr. Dr. Oliver, please. Dr. Marcus. Dr. Batul Zahra. Professor Dr. Ansam Al Maruf. Dr. Asil Timimi.
دكتور زينب اياد or somebody in the behalf of her Dr. Asim Mehdi, Professor Dr. Maryam Safara, Dr. Hassan, Thank you very much, Dr. Palal. Thank you. Now I call to the platform Dr. Hassan, the Director of Teaching and Higher Education Department in the Hall Abbas Shrine. <laughs> Professor Dr. Liqa Tektim. Professor Dr. Saleh Al Mamouri, Dr. Safa Naji Abid, or someone on behalf of her. Safa Abnais. Dr. Muhammad Sultani. Dr. Ali Rada. Dr. Mariam Dweich. <coughs> Dr. Manal Karim. Dr. Masoma. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much. Now I call uh, Professor Dr. Riyad Al Amidi to complete honoring the researchers, and he is the director of Al Amin Society for Scientific and Intellectual Research. Dr. Murtada Firazin. Dr. Doha Abbas. Dr. Doha Fadal Abbas. Or somebody on behalf of her. Okay. 
Professor Dr. Abbas Hassan Jasim. Professor Dr. Hashim Alewi. Dr. Adawiye Sattar. Thank you very much, Dr. Riyad, for honoring the researchers. Thank you very much. Okay, Where well, you have been? Okay. Yes, Waha. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much. Today, we are more proud than just proud for having such researchers and such attendance. And it's hard to say we are to drop the curtain, but we shall say we are to meet next year, inshallah, with different targets, different missions, bi'idhnillah ta'ala, fi amallah. But I want to shed light on the night, tonight uh, workshop at 10 o'clock, okay? And it's for uh, the importance of education and translation of Ahlul Bayt ethics and literature. And thank you.